Patrick, you there? Yeah. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Uh, we're here talking to uh, Patrick Graffini, who currently blogs at uh, townhall.com and who was formerly the uh, new media advisor for Rudy Giuliani's presidential campaign. How are you doing today, Patrick? Very good. How are you? Great. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, kind of first kick us off here with kind of a brief history of uh, how you got to Giuliani's campaign and uh, then, you know, kind of why you're at Town Hall now. Sure. Uh, well, um, you know, I was in the last election cycle. Uh, I was at the RNC as the e-campaign director. So that, uh, that's 04 then, not 06? That was 06. 06. So, yeah, we... Uh, uh, and that little, I'd like to forget 06, but... Uh, <laughs> but you yeah. can't, huh? I can't. So, so what, what was your role at the RNC for 06? I, I was the e-campaign director, okay. uh, which was basically managing the web web operation, um, blog outreach, uh, all that jazz. And then uh, somehow you got rolled into the Giuliani campaign after that. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, in an advisory, in an advisory role, um, so... Um, and uh, now I'm doing my own doing my own firm. So you have your own firm now. What what kind of clients do you have? Uh, a lot of you know congressional uh, clients. Uh, you know people looking to use the web. You know as a strategic as a strategic vehicle. And I think uh, there's a need for a lot of that. As and we're and I, and I know that that'll be part of our discussion today. Great. Um, so you are the new media advisor for Rudy Giuliani. I was hoping you could tell our viewers kind of, uh, you know, loosely what you did there and, you know, you might want to talk about that so much. So more broadly, what you think um, presidential campaigns should be doing in that role. Like I know, you know, we have like Peter Dow is in that role for Hillary Clinton and uh, uh, Patrick Hines is doing that role for John McCain, uh, Stephen Smith for Mitt Romney. Uh, you know, each of the big campaigns has their own person in that new media advisor role. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about, you know, what they should be doing, what are they doing, and what, what is not working, what kind of, what is this new position? You know, I mean, the people you mentioned, I have enormous respect for all of them. Um, you know, it, it is kind of, uh, it is kind of soup to nuts. I mean, uh, you know, Pat, uh, obviously on the McCain campaign, does a lot of the blog outreach. I was doing a lot of the blog outreach when I was there. Which consists of what, exactly? Uh, you know, reaching out, you know, when you when you have conference calls, get, primarily getting information out there, making sure kind of your surrogates are, uh, are you know, getting out their books and blog interviews, and you're using the medium uh, to your fullest advantage. Um so, so you, you know, in that role, you're kind of like uh, kind of like a cross between a deputy press secretary and like a, a labor outreach person, kind of. I'd probably say yeah, because blogs are a little bit of everything. I mean, they're a little activist, they're a little uh, you know, they're a little activist, and they're a little uh, journalist. So um, yeah, you know, you gotta it, it, it does blend the roles quite nicely, I think. And so you know, of do you, do you see any other roles you know that the new media advisor? Needs to be doing or should to be or should be doing. You know, but you got to split it out. I think between you know the people who are talking to the bloggers and the people who are who are, who are doing the message and uh, the day to day kind of rapid response in the blogosphere, and the folks who are uh, building the website and doing uh, you know doing videos, doing the, the online fundraising, doing all of the blocking and tackling of a traditional uh, new media campaign. Uh, sometimes people kind of get those two confused. They think, well, we got a blog person, so you know, why do we need a web person? Or we got a web person, why do we need a blog person? But it's actually two sides of the same coin. And a lot of the guys who are kind of doing the, the web stuff, you know, the, the geeky kind of technology stuff, are a little bit more, maybe a little bit more in the background, but their job is just, I think, just as important. And, uh, you know, I've certainly done a little bit of both. So I, I can... Yeah, I can relate. I can relate to that. Well, what was some of the background stuff you did for the RNC in '06? Well, I mean, I think just building. I mean, really, just rebuilding the website, making sure that all the stuff we did. I mean, I was also on the Bush campaign, making sure all the stuff, all the really cool stuff we did on the Bush campaign, got rolled into the RNC. That we had, you know, a robust. Kind what, of, what were the successes for the '04 Bush campaign? Since you actually had success there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we had we had a tremendous amount of success from recruiting 1.4 million volunteers for the campaign, which was which was something that people um, kind of after the fact really appreciated. 
Um, what was the online dimension of that, though? I mean, you, you can spit out those numbers like 1.4 million volunteers. The, 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 the online dimensions of that was uh, that the vast majority of those folks were recruited by the web. And so um, what exactly did they, did they do for Bush? Uh, these are the people who walked the precincts, made the phone calls, um, did the did all of the did all kind of the traditional campaign, but they were kind of large to a large degree recruited online, and we gave them stuff to do online as well in that vein, which is basically, I mean, I think one of the big successes of that campaign was that after the fact, people kind of realized, you know, people we had we had the same debate, uh, you know, who's ahead, who's behind online. Uh, we had the same debate back in '04. I, I remember very vividly. And after the fact, after you know we won, and after the fact, people realized, wait a second, you had the right strategy there. I mean, in terms of mobilizing the grassroots, doing house parties, getting people to use the web to contact other voters instead of maybe the Kerry campaign, which was sending you know fundraising emails uh, up to I think October 29th or something something like that. Uh, and obviously, you know, that was, you know, that got a lot of headlines, a lot of press. Um, but at the end of the day, people realize, well, wait a second. You know, I think we, the, the web effort is multifaceted. It's both yeah, it money to and me, it's grassroots. You know, in 04, you know, uh, people in the Netroots love to talk about, you know, how uh, decentralized it is. Um, you know, they're more about building communities, et cetera, uh, while the conservative blogosphere is more top-down. Uh, but you know, as you just pointed out, in '04, that seemed to help you know the Bush administration, the Bush campaign, because they were able to direct their web operations, their online operations, into actually doing stuff that would help them at the polls. Whereas there's a whole hodgepodge of uh, groups on the on the left, from you know George Soros's funders group to Move On, who are all doing their own kind of separate projects. But they, you know, they were kept reaching the same people in in Ohio and all the d- districts that you know. Uh, ended up mattering, and there was no, you know, direct strategic focus to it that seemed to end up hurting them in the end. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you had obviously 527s doing things. Um, you know, you had obviously move on, which, you know, I mean, I, I kind of go back and forth. I mean, everyone, we, we, I wrote a post on this the other day, which is like everyone wants to create the move on of the right, but if you actually, first of all, I don't think you can create anything of quote unquote of the right. I think it has to be new, it has to be different, or else why how is it going to catch on if you're just copying something else? Um, it would be my re- response to those folks. Not that a lot of the things that move on is doing it aren't great and you, you can't do them. but on a larger kind of strategic level, I do kind of qu- I mean I do kind of have questioned the efficacy of move on because they had this disjointed turnout operation which wasn't connected at all to the Democratic Party. And frankly, I mean, they've, they've used their money to air a lot of ads, which I can tell you just, you know, maybe this is just my perspective on it. I don't think they're any good. Yeah, maybe, maybe someone maybe on the left can weigh in on that. Although there was a, a study I linked to this week um, by some, I think, some Princeton uh, either economists or uh, political scientists that showed uh, move on turnout effort did boost uh, turnout in their targeted precincts by 7%. Um, that, that doesn't mean their overall strategy of turnout was good or that, you know, it could have been better directed strategically if it was folded in within the Kerry campaign. But to be fair, from from the one study that I've seen, they did uh, boost turnout. So um, I guess I'll defend them a little bit there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think turnout was across, was up all the way across the board, and it was so, I mean, it was way up more than we even we expected it to be um, in, both, in both areas. So, you know, certainly, you know, tip of the hat there if it's warranted. So, uh, having looking at the uh, success Bush had in '04, um, and and taking those lessons to uh, primary season of '08, are there any campaigns on the Dem or White House side that you see uh, effectively leveraging, you know, kind of the new media blog world? You know, it's kind of it's kind of seemed to tell for um, you know I think for what we were talking about, which is kind of the nuts and bolts of getting people to the polls. I mean, it's still it's still, still early for that. It's still pretty early to to analyze that part of it. I mean, I'm sure that I mean I know a lot of the people at the different campaigns. So you know, knowing 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 all of them and knowing many of them, at least on the Republican side, I can tell you, you know, those are prob- that that is probably going to be very high high on the list. 
Um, but right now, I mean, obviously, I mean, you're seeing the development of social media uh, as being kind of the big buzzword of the 08 cycle. For example? Uh, YouTube, okay. MySpace, Facebook as being, and, you know, there's a big debate, you know, is that is this going to be, you know, is that kind of a false flag? Is that is that where the action well, is really going to be? I'm sure you have be? an opinion on it, Patrick, so huh? what is it? Sorry, go ahead. I, I missed that. I said I'm sure you have an opinion on, you know, Facebook, my page, YouTube, and, and the efficacy of them. So, so let's let's have you go ahead and take a position. I think as far it's, as it's a great. I think they are effective. Actually, I'll, I'll probably differ from some folks on that, but I think you got to figure out what are they effective for. And I think they're effective at reaching kind of your influentials, uh, your volunteers, your your folks who, um, you know, will maybe uh, not necessarily. You don't necessarily need to motivate them to get out and vote. Uh, they're already going to vote. Would you would you group all those sites to together vote. though? Uh, MySpace, uh, Facebook, and YouTube. It seems to me they all have kind of like their own different segments and. That, that's yeah. true. I mean, there was that study, and I, I, I'm sure you saw it, that came out a week ago about kind of the demographics on the different websites, on, on MySpace being kind of a more, uh, you know, let's say, um, you know, not to use the pejorative term, but a more downscale demographic, Facebook being kind of more up, upscale right. college kids, um, folks who I would call them the kind of the young influentials. Uh, YouTube is obviously, I mean, that should, I mean, we were, we were dealing in YouTube, you know, heavily in the last election cycle, so um, you don't need to tell me about that. Um, and certainly I think that's more of an across-the-board uh, type thing, and it's interesting because it's very accessible. Um, you know, anyone who visits a blog or anyone who visits any kind of site uh, is, you know, doesn't necessarily need to be part of the, quote, YouTube community uh, to participate. So it's, a, it's something that, uh, you know, has been very effective in terms of distributing video um, like you, this you, one. You talked about that uh, study about the different demographics of Facebook and MySpace. And, and since you're making a kind of an influential volunteer argument for the efficacy of the social networking sites, would you then uh, extrapolate and conclude that Facebook would therefore be the superior tool to MySpace since it has a... Uh, more desirable demographic. You know, I think it's um, it's kind of seen to tell. I mean, it's it's. Um, I, I actually would harken back. I, I, I noticed something is interesting. This was in the Philadelphia. Uh, I used to go to school there, so uh, that's hence my interest in it. But this was in the Philadelphia Democratic primary, and I looked at the number of MySpace friends to the ratio of votes that. Uh, the candidates received, and in one case, in a few cases, it was like one in it was something like one in ten uh, of the. Pri I mean, literally, somebody got sixty thousand votes, and they got six thousand MySpace friends. Think about that in a general election uh, where it's six million. That would be the equivalent of six million MySpace. So, friends. Did, did you find this as a trend beyond just a couple of candidates? I mean, what what, what kind yeah, of? Were some candidates had more, some candidates had less. Incidentally, the winning candidate had less uh, of a ratio of support of, of supporters. Maybe he just got started late. I don't know. But it was interesting because you would think that this was a primary, right? Right. So this is a Democratic primary uh, where only a few people. I mean young people will generally not vote. So I would imagine that all of those people were outside the traditional turnout universe that were on MySpace. So I would think that would have been, um, something like that might have been a proving ground to see that these people vote. And I don't know if maybe, maybe not. I mean, it was uh, obviously the winner didn't get, you know, the winner of that primary, Michael Nutter, didn't, you know, have as many MySpace friends as, as, uh, as some of the other candidates, but he did just fine and uh, did just fine, I think, with that demographic as well. Did you end up doing a post on that, or you just noticed that from the election returns? I, uh, I may have posted it as a comment somewhere. Ah, but uh, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to find that for the yeah. blogging headers but out it's, there. But it's out there. So um, one uh, GOP candidate that has had a very you know kind of new media focus, even though he's not declared yet, has been has been Fred Thompson. I know you've been uh, paying attention to his rollout both uh, before both when you were with Giuliani and, and now that you're over there at Town Hall. Um, how effective do you think that's been, uh, and and how long do you think he can last in this, you know, only posting in a red state going on Sean, Han Sean Hannity world before he has to join the rest of the field at uh, the debates? You know, it's it's been interesting. I actually have my my cigar here, holding it up to the camera, <laughs> oh, uh, no. just paying homage to Fred Thompson. I, I thought. Well, I, know, I'm not Michael Moore, so I don't know how yeah, effective that's so, going to be. Uh, 
<laughs> you know, you don't need to worry about that. And uh, but um, you know, I think um, you know, I think it's it's very interesting the strategy he's trying, which is it's very decentralized from the standpoint of he's going to go out and go to Powerline to get his message out. He's going to go out and go to Red State to get his message out. He's going to do a lot of blog media. And, you know, I don't think even they believe that potentially, oh, this is going to reach, you know, millions and millions of voters. But what it does do is probably reach, you know, the, the influentials. I mean, it probably does reach the, the folks who are paying attention to this campaign. And that may be, that number may be in the hundreds of thousands out of a, out of a primary electorate of, of 10 or so million. So it's not a mass persuasion. Uh, Although tool. when you're talking about influentials, you don't even think that you're just you know reaching those. You're hoping those influentials then go talk to right. Their they'll go talk to other people. But I think more crucially, I mean, because I mean, yeah, they talk to other people. Um, although, Con, I don't know how many non-political people you've talked to today. I certainly haven't talked to many. <laughs> so I, 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 I love this myth that you know we're all going to go out and talk to. You know, ten thousand friends and relatives, and maybe maybe that's my my wife could care less about politics. Right, mine too. So, um, yeah, but uh, I think what it does do though is influence the media, and I think it influences you guys more than anything. And through which then I think that the tenor, the inflection of media coverage, then goes out and informs uh, you know a, a lot of the rest of the electorate. So really, almost almost more debate setting than anything else, fr- framing, if you will. Right, right. Uh, keeping on Thompson, uh, you know, as, as well as he's been doing, he ran into uh, some problems this week with uh, lobbying reform, or not lobbying reform, but his past lobbying, and specifically his uh, an LA Times piece about him uh, possibly making some phone calls on behalf on uh, of a pro-choice group uh, back in the uh, mid '90s. Um, do you I, I, do you think this story is going to hurt him at all, or do you think he, he handled it well? You know, it's um, it, it, I kind of have to. I mean, yeah, but you know, at the same time, that uh, he's not necessarily the first candidate to be attacked on uh, maybe changing one of his positions in the past. Uh, he's not necessarily the first candidate to have been attacked for maybe uh, in the eyes of kind of the pro-life base of the party an imperfect record. On the issue, right. Um, so after, you know, Mitt Romney, of course, after Brownback, right. after Giuliani, you know, yeah, at some I mean, point, I mean, it's just you like just, you just got to question who's left. I mean, if, if if that's, I mean, especially with McCain, you know, obviously looking like he might be fading back. Uh, you know, who is left that has a perfect record that you know is a serious candidate, and the answer is increasingly no one. So I think that that in, the, in that sense that'll probably fall flat a little bit. And where the where exactly, I mean, after you've trashed McCain, you've trashed Giuliani, you've trashed Romney, uh, you know, I think even even some folks, I mean, they may be a little bit disillusioned, but I don't think they're necessarily going to go, all right, now we have to go to a fifth guy? I mean, how's that going to well, work? Well, let me answer, ask you this then. What's, what's so bad about Huckabee? You know, I think... Uh, it's a, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, you know, Brownback you know loves to fight with Romney and the rest, but Brown, right. but Huckabee also has an impeccable. Well, the, the problem I think, I, I mean, I would say this is the, this is my putting on my insider DC hat, which is you know normally I try not to not to put that on. Um, but putting on my my insider hat for a second here. Uh, the fact is, he hasn't necessarily been as serious. I think about building kind of the the organization. Uh, which was reflected in the fact that you know he, he only raised like five hundred thousand dollars in the first quarter, and maybe I mean he did a lot better in the second quarter, I think, but still still far behind. Uh, and that hasn't been, and I think by all accounts, it's not something that's that's necessarily that he's necessarily tried tried to do. Um, so maybe you know this might fall under you know the life is not fair kind of uh, kind of category here. I mean, ultimately, does he have the capacity? to wage a winning campaign, that even if he does shock people in Iowa, even if he does shock people, comes in a strong second or third in New Hampshire, I mean, just thinking about that, is that going to provide enough juice to leapfrog, you know, potentially three very strong uh, high-name ID national candidates? Um, no, you know, I, it, I agree with you. It, it's still a long shot. You know, it's just that after every debate, you know, I'm, I'm plugging through the uh, conservative blogs, and it's just like, you know, 
People at Red State love Mike Huckabee's performance. The people at the corner love Mike Huckabee's performance. Yeah, you my, know, my favorite, and I mean, if you look at that, that role for me, my favorite would be Duncan Hunter. I mean, the guy who has no shot, but uh, seems to make sense. I think Huckabee is a little bit too, I don't know, he seems a little bit not too folksy, but just to, when he's talking about the war on terror, I honestly want to hear a down home anecdote. Uh, you know, but uh, I feel that way. I, I felt that same way about certainly him at some points and other candidates as well. But still, you know, just so to just kind of not build an organization, no, no other silver bullet as to why uh, Huckabee's not catching fire yet, huh? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, it's, it, it's again, I think there's only a certain amount of political oxygen out there. And, uh, you know, the question is, are you, are you in the right place at the right time? to capture it. At one point, I thought he could have been like the John McCain of this cycle. I mean, think about it. He has these positions that you, you, you guys in the evil mainstream media, you know, love. I mean, at some level, I mean, he's uh, particularly on, I mean, he's taken an unorthodox position on immigration. Um, you know, on some of these, he's disagreed with the base on certain issues, not on the social issues, but, you know, on some of the economic issues. So I would think, like, maybe, you know, I, I thought maybe a, at some point about a year ago, hey, you know, maybe the media, maybe he'll become the media darling of this cycle, but I don't know if he's, he's done that yet. Well, it's hard to be the media darling and be the conservative base's darling, but, you know, everyone talks about how, you know, after George Allen got macaqued out of the race, you know, there was no you know, down-home, southern, Republican, uh, pro-life candidate left. And, you know, then, you know, people thought it might be you know, McCain or someone stuff in that role. But at the same time, it's like, well, Huckabee's been there the whole time, and I just can't figure out why, you know, if – I guess this is back to framing. I guess I just really never buy into the fact that there has to be someone in that role to begin with. Um, and, and Huckabee hasn't caught on in that role. I, and I think there wasn't that role was vacant. And you're maybe you're maybe maybe seeing Fred Thompson as unlikely as that might seem fill that role. But you're right in that you know always about it always seems that about 25 percent of the Iowa caucus vote is reserved for for guys like that, the guys who have no shot. You know, who um, you know uh, whether it was Pat Robertson in '88 all the way up to you know Gary Bauer and Alan Keyes, who I think did did not bad. I mean, I don't know. They came anywhere close, but they did not bat for where they were nationally. Uh, so it always seems like there's room for a breakout candidate. I mean, my, my prediction has long been potentially Brown back 20% in Iowa, but, you know, I think with the addition of Thompson in the race, uh, that might be a little bit more, I mean, it might be hard, a little bit harder to pull off just because people have been searching for so long and they may, have, they may think they have found that person. Doesn't mean he's going to get the nomination. So um, I, I know you're a Giuliani guy, yeah. but, you know, for those, you know, people who look at Thompson and say, you know, what is this guy's issue, you know, what, what, what is his appeal? He doesn't really have a platform so far. He's just out there making Michael Moore videos. What, what is his, what, why do you think he has been able to kind of explode on the scene without, you know, barely li lifting a finger? Yeah, I, you never know that, but I do think that, uh, you know, in politics, um, Sometimes you know issues are overrated as kind of a uh, as kind of a yardstick, and you know you could make whatever comment on that that you, you'd like. But you know people certainly like his personality. Uh, people like Rudy's personality as well. Um, they certainly like you know his style and the fact that I mean the Michael Moore video, and you know while certainly not every voter saw that video. Um, you know you certainly saw how um, you know how well received that was. Um, but, you know, I, I do think people are kind of, you know, potentially hungry for an alternative. You know, it's, it's, it's been, you know, there's been no traditional rock-ripped conservative uh, in the race. George Allen was, could have been that guy had he decisively won re-election, which <laughs> obviously I don't need to tell you he didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, potentially I think that's, that's I mean, that, that's the best reason I think I can come up with. How much do you think it has to do with name ID? I mean, you know, I... When I, whenever I look at the polls, I see you know Rudy Giuliani out in front and uh, Thompson, and then well we'll get to May McCain in a second. But it seemed everybody who was out there, you know, were just kind of uh, they have other dimensions too. But they were also just basically celebrity candidates. You know, Rudy being famous for 9/11, Fred Thompson being famous for his movie career, Hunt for October, uh, Law and Order, etc. McCain just for having been on the scene for so long. Uh, 
how much do you think it was just like, oh my God, here's a well famous known guy who we, we can, you know, is an empty vessel for whatever hopes and dreams you want to put into. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, he might be the Obama of the, the field. Who knows? I mean, it, it does. I, 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 it does kind of put politics in perspective. Think about this. I mean. You know, I mean, obviously people know him from his movie roles, but I don't necessarily think, I mean, A, he hasn't been in that many movies lately. I mean, he's been on Law & Order, uh, which I don't know what kind of ratings Law & Order gets, but I, I know it's, I don't know if it's anywhere close to, like, American Idol or anywhere close to being the most watched uh, show in the country, and probably some fan, Law & Order fan will probably write, write to me and correct me on that. Um, but uh, it, it's an interesting perspective that someone like that, who's, a, who's basically got a... A uh, modest role in, uh, you know, a, a decently rated uh, TV drama can step onto the scene and be second. You know, I, I mean, it, 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 obviously some of that has to do with uh, I think his personality, but obviously, I mean, I don't know how well people know him from his time in the Senate uh, or how well people know him. I think they do know him from his, his films. I think they do know him from TV. And it's, it's interesting to see how, uh, you know, how someone like that uh, can so quickly uh, can vault to hey he's got more name ID than Mitt Romney it kind of puts all this this political thing in perspective you know when you think about it it does it does um, so moving on to uh, the uh, collapse of John McCain um, I I kind of had a uh, a running you know subhead on the blogometer for a couple weeks before the uh, fundraising news came in and it was you know. Uh, what was your favorite moment of the McCain era? Kind of a uh, sarcastic slap at uh, you know predicting his doom, even though it hasn't happened yet. And of course, the McCain now, death watch. Now it pretty much has. Um, were you were you surprised that it, that it happened this soon? Uh, and and more importantly, what do you attribute it to? And after that, you know, what do you think it says about the the future of the uh, GOP field? Uh, I would say I'm not surprised that it happened. I'm surprised that it happened this soon. Um, and maybe that's kind of a natural cautiousness, you know. Um, but uh, I don't, I've don't. i never agreed with the assessment that he was really the front runner. Uh, I thought he would have been a strong candidate, potentially. I mean, I think maybe in a, in a unique situation could have gotten the nomination. But I never agreed with this assessment. You know, he's going to raise, you know, uh, so much money and utterly dominate the field. I mean, this is no, a guy... I, I, I never could figure out where that money was going to come from. Right. I mean, and this is a guy who never raised any money out of cycle. I mean, he, he, people were talking about him not running for re-election in 2004 um, because he hadn't raised any money. And all of a sudden, he's going to go out and get all this money. In retrospect, now, obviously, in retrospect, it seems it seems obvious um, it did seem, though, that they were signing up a lot of these Rangers and Pioneers. People were just going to go with the guy who they thought they could win. And the fact that none of that came through, I mean, it was, 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 was a mild shock to me. I mean, I thought, you know, he'd raise a lot of money, but at the end of the day, primary voters would not really take, take kindly to him because of his stances on immigration, uh, Gang of 14, campaign finance, the whole litany of issues. I mean, it's, it's not just one issue. Um, but uh, in the end, even the donor base uh, wasn't with them. Let me let me stop you right there for a second, because uh, a lot of people look at Rudy Giuliani as being sympathetic to immigration, someone who, uh, mayor of New York. How was Rudy able to, you know, sidestep the the immigration furor and uh, you know position himself for McCain to get throttled by it, while Giuliani appears, you know, so you know pro security. You know, I think it's it's just I think it does, it does come down to personal style. I mean, this is somebody who, you know, w even when he's McCain, even when he shared conservative positions, has gone out of his way seemingly to anger the conservative base. And Rudy is someone who you know doesn't agree with you, may not agree with you on every issue, but he's someone that you like and you can trust. And he's kind of a, he seems to be at least a straight shooter, and he, he's kind of open about his opinions and doesn't really try and. You know, try and uh, yell at you, or you know, or, or you know, those famous kind of McCain outbursts, you know, uh, you know, off the Senate floor. Um, yeah, so, Rudy. Rudy never tries to out moralize you with this, you know. Right. I, I care about these people more than you do, kind of stuff. Right. And then, and I think that that. I mean, it, it again goes back to, you know, it's maybe not necessarily the positions on the issues as much as your personal style and the, and the kind of the, the righteousness I think people saw in McCain. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it's still, you know, it's still early yet. I mean, I think there may, there may be a, a small glimmer of hope. I mean, let's see how his poll numbers start uh, holding up. And they seem to be holding up, and maybe this is kind of a beltway maelstrom. But it's hard to see, you know, how he runs this this kind of well, you know, it's, uh, it's not just campaign. It's not just a beltway maelstrom. I mean, he's you know hemorrhaging staff in all in all the big states. Um, right. You know, let alone yes. the guys getting arrested for solicitation in Florida. He's got people law-abiding staffers quitting too. Right, and I think I mean it's a question. I mean, can the, can a guy get elected without staff? You know, uh, we're about to see. I guess. Probably not, but who knows? Maybe he'll prove us wrong and, you know, dramatically slash campaign payrolls in the future. Uh, now, I know you've been talking about how McCain was the front runner, uh, well, at least that some people in the Bellway felt, felt that way. And, of course, uh, George Allen was at one point considered the front runner. And you have a post up on Town Hall today uh, taking issue with the fact that National Journal now has Romney tied with uh, Giuliani as the, uh, the front runner for the GOP nomination. And I wanted to give you a, a second to bash insiderness and uh, the uh, Romney's chances. Well, I found that interesting because uh, if you actually look, I mean, I follow the trading sites pretty religiously, in trade and, and, and the others. And uh, if you look it, at... But in trade's the biggest one, right? In, in trade's the biggest one, so, you know, I obviously pay the most attention to them. But if you look at in trade, um, you know, Mitt Romney has certainly been, he's been on, on a downslope in the last couple of weeks. I mean, he was up, he was up there, I think, almost tied. I mean, it was almost a four-way tie uh, maybe three or four weeks ago or, or something like that before kind of the McCain money story started coming out. Um, and, uh, you know, lately it's been Giuliani has risen back, Thompson has risen back, Romney's now at 20%. I think it's about a 40-40-20 split in terms of likelihood of getting the nomination. Um, so it's interesting that that, that kind of, that, which that is supposed to be sort of an insider prediction market in terms of people are putting down real money and betting, you know, and effectively on who's going to win. And you've got the D.C. insider saying, no, it's going to be McCain. Or, no, it's, sorry, it's going to be Romney. <laughs> um, or potentially more likely to be Romney. And you got to kind of, I just kind of, I stepped back and said, how'd that McCain thing work out for you? I mean, initially McCain was the prohibitive Front, I mean, not even just the front runner, the prohibitive front runner, uh, with this with this audience, and that kind of spilled out into even to, into some of the trading markets. But they don't seem to be following that cue, and are still rating. I think Thompson, in terms of the Thompson Romney split, I think they've got him flipped. Uh, have there been any you know studies done on how well in trade is done? I mean, I know you know looking back in just 2006, um, they you know really didn't turn right in the right direction on the then takeover of the House or Senate until very, very late, and I think they got the Senate wrong. Yeah, I think uh, I have to go back and look. Look, I think you've got to um, potentially take a look at take that, that even in trade with a grain of salt. I mean, I take the insiders maybe two grains of salt, and I take in trade with a grain of salt. Uh, because I think fundamentally what they are is not this, this hugely predictive I mean, I just don't know. It's, 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 it seems to me it's impossible to predict. Obviously, I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, you know, a certain, I mean, that's, obvi that's obvious. But it's impossible to predict how 10 million people, 100 million people, how exactly they are going to come down. But what, what, it, what, what it does do, it seems, is it, they're basically, I mean, I would say conventional wisdom aggregators. I mean, they're better than polls probably. Because uh, they tell you more about intensity of support, maybe money, some of the developments in the campaign. But it's still just people guessing, right? I mean, does, how does it tell you about intensity of support? Well, no, I, I do think uh, people discount, like people for the longest time discounted Rudy, for instance, um, I would say. I mean, people said, he, he's got no shot of winning. I mean, yeah, it's, it supports a mile wide. Well, well as, I guess in a card-carrying member of the mainstream media, I don't think it was so much that people didn't think that he... You know, had a long shot. People just didn't think he was going to run. Right, and that was that was obviously. I mean, how do you predict? Obviously, in that case, how do you predict what one guy is going to do? <laughs> you know, maybe you could. In the case could be made that hey, this is the electorate. You could probably predict what the electorate's going to do. But ultimately, the the inputs that are going into in trade are polling, conventional wisdom, kind of the media buzz. The uh, and they're not really. Divine and going out and talk again. It's it's the political operatives talk. I mean, the political junkies. They don't talk to their friends. They're watching C-SPAN all day. 
So I think they're taking those inputs. I don't, rather know, I don't than, know about that. I mean, the, in, the insiders I know, you know, have people on the ground in, in you know, Iowa, right. have no people, you know, reporters, precinct captains in, in New Hampshire. Yeah. And they are talking to those people. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be uh, unfair in that regard. I do think, like, you're talking to, when you're talking to, to folks in Iowa, um, but they they are still talking to the influentials in Iowa. Iowa is a little bit of a different beast, I'd say, because it's such a tight uh, environment, tight, tight caucus universe. I mean, only I mean, you pretty much know who's going to vote in that caucus. Uh, let's talk maybe about New Hampshire. I mean, New Hampshire. I mean, I remember I was up in New Hampshire for Bush in 2000. Uh, we got killed, and everybody thought, yeah, we're probably going to lose. I mean, I remember being up there, but maybe by three, four, five points, nobody could have predicted that John McCain would have won by 19 points right. in New Hampshire. I mean, that was just not on anybody's radar screen. Just like, I mean, maybe it's some, the, out, the outcome of some races in 06. I mean, that just was not on anybody's radar screen. Um, I think it's great for telling us the snapshot of where we are now. I don't necessarily think it's really predictive at all, uh, uh, to be quite honest with you. The, the, the insider's poll or the uh, in-trade? The, the uh, in-trade. Um, so I don't think we have a we, – obviously we haven't gotten a perfect tool yet. Uh, so moving away from whether or not the insider's poll or in-trade is better, um, your, your post also went into uh, kind of like uh, the case against Romney getting the nomination, not whether or not he'd be a good candidate. So – let me kind of make the pro-Romney case, and then you shoot it down here. Uh, Romney is ahead in Iowa and New Hampshire, the first two states. Uh, he's not well-known uh, nationally. Most people have no idea who he is. Where Romney has spent money on ads telling his story, um, spending the money to raise his name idea, ID, which is in Iowa and New Hampshire. He has gone from third and fourth place to first place in those two states. Uh, after... Romney wins Iowa and New Hampshire. He gets a big bump nationally. He starts spending money in the other big states. And after people start hearing the story, know who he is in, in those states, he does well on, uh, you know, Giga Tuesday, Titanic Tuesday, whatever people are calling it right now. And, uh, you know, after that, he's going to have uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, a couple of, uh, you know, bigger states on Tuesday. And uh, Giuliani and Thompson are uh, on the wrong end of a delegate count. Yeah, I think... Uh you know, so I think that's that's the premise, uh, certainly behind behind a lot of the Romney buzz right now. I would say this: I mean, he's number one in Iowa, and New Hampshire right now, uh, which means he po- couldn't really possibly be doing any better. Um, and especially when so, so he can only go down. Is is uh, he can only go down? I mean, obviously, uh, and that's and that's the that's the that's the problem. I mean, have they peaked too soon? Is the question. I mean, obviously, when I mean, they have a lot of ads. Um, uh, but none of the other candidates have aired any ads, and you know I think it's always easy to move the numbers when no one else well, is advertising. None of the top tier candidates. Duncan none Hunter's been up there. None, obviously, none, maybe Duncan Hunter. Uh, I don't know, but um, but Rudy has. Yeah, but but Rudy McCain. I don't. I don't see where McCain's going to get the money to do, to do that. Um, but Rudy hasn't. McCain hasn't. Thompson obviously hasn't. And do you see that number kind of those caucus numbers kind of even up once? You know, you have three or four candidates on TV constantly, um, and or does has Romney bought himself kind of a permanent advantage in those states? I mean, I, w- I would kind of t- to use somewhat of an obscure example, Dick DeVos in Michigan. You know, huge self-funding candidate last cycle, uh, spent ad- did a lot of ads. I think it was May or June. I mean, it was very early in the cycle. Got out to a four or five point lead. Uh, and then lost by 15 points, got kind of swept out by by the tidal wave. Um, but, but because he was able to run those ads, he 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 rose in the polls, and he you know he was. The, the, but that poll result was 20 points off of where he was eventually on election day. Look, I don't just kind of, I think they probably have a very strong organization. I mean, they probably and I wrote this in my post. They probably scared people out of Iowa right now. Uh, I don't see how. You know, or at least right now, how folks are going to kind of tiptoe back. And who's going to be the first to kind of tiptoe back into Iowa uh, as a result of Romney's early strength there? I do think kind of the big battleground may become New Hampshire at this point because, I mean, if, if everyone's kind of expecting Romney to win Iowa, the question is, does he win New Hampshire with McCain's weakness, uh, first of all? And uh, 
you know, him being next door. If he loses this, I mean, if he loses the state next door to him, that's I think very that's very tough. Uh, I would say for him. So I think so it's on, on one sense terrible. it's a strength. He's he, you know he's built up Iowa New Hampshire, but in another sense he's backed himself into a corner, and then if he loses either, he's pretty much done. Yeah. So he's got he's got that uh, hurdle. Uh, so in his last five minutes here, uh, I want to touch bases with you on uh, the uh, Republicans being behind online. Um, I know you know you've written a number of posts on the subject, uh, and I was wondering if you could uh, tell us. You know why you think they are behind. Well, first of all, make the case that they are, and then second, uh, kind of explain what your theory as to why that is. We're behind online. <laughs> I'm not taking that line down. Um, you know, I think there's. I think people have got to kind of calm down a little bit on this on this question, um, because what you're talking about. Um, I think there. First of all, let me back up. I think there's probably some merit to the arguments that are being made that Republicans are behind. You could you could toss out any. Well, let number. me let me you know put some metrics out there for you. Right. Um, you know they're getting ra- out raised online by like five to one. Um, as someone who's always looking at YouTube numbers and uh, uh, Technorati and Alexa numbers, you know the the traffic is like also like you know five sometimes ten to one. Uh, there's just a lot more eyeballs and money flowing through the Democratic side than there is the GOP side. Well, first of all, I wouldn't agree. I, I wouldn't agree with that characterization of, of five to one. I mean, maybe you know, I mean, two to one, maybe, maybe, maybe two to one, three to one. Sometimes uh, on the outside, maybe uh, what I've been seeing. But yeah, I mean, you know, at the same time, right, we're arguing over kind of semantics at that level. Um, it, it, first of all, I think it's also interesting. I don't think Hillary or Edwards have released online fundraising numbers. For the second quarter, uh, Edwards has. I, I don't have them to take my okay. finger, but I, I, I know. I know you see what Hillary did as well. That, we also that don't, I don't know think what, she has released. Yet. We also don't know what Fred Thompson has done um, in that. I mean, I was I was one of the first to break the story on Town Hall that he had raised something like three hundred thousand dollars in his first twenty four hours of being uh, being announced and having a website up, which which if it were if it were to hold would would portend a very very strong. Uh, you know, at least start for him online. Um, so I think in that in that respect, it might be soon to itself. However, I mean, I'll, I'll say this: I do think that it is a factor. I mean, to the extent that it's a factor of anything of the political environment right now, which is obviously not favorable to Republicans. You have you've had a number of polls say, you know, Republicans are just not as energized about their their candidates. You've actually had a number of polls say uh, there was one, the New York Times poll, which of uh, 18 to 29 year olds, which, which said something like about 18 or 20 percent each uh, of that demographic was excited. I mean, quote unquote, excited about Hillary or Obama. Uh, contrast: the Republican candidates were way low on that. I think Edwards was also way low, but I think that again, that's an enthusiasm issue, and I don't think that's necessarily oh we're. You know, they're all Democrats are all geeks, and they're all online, and they all happen to congregate there. I mean, I think, you know, there there might be some of that on blogs, but I don't think blogs are are, are the be all end all, and particularly in presidential uh, presidential politics for for the purposes of our discussion here. Uh, but I do think again, it's the environment. I think it's it's uh, you know, I think people aren't necessarily as excited, I and mean, it will be interesting to see if Hillary is the nominee. You know, what Republicans do then, you know, if they can't get excited about Hillary as the nominee and you have a relatively, you know, uh, decent Republican candidate. Well, first of all, you had John Kerry. People certainly turned out for him against Bush. (laughs) So uh, are you trying to say that Democrats weren't excited about John Kerry? And they weren't excited. They didn't love John Kerry. But, you know, they they, they seem to have at least a decent uh, performance. But. You know, the question is, can Republicans get excited online or offline against Hillary? You know, and if we can't, you know, what are we in, what are we in business for? So I, I, I have to believe that they will to at least some extent and will to a, probably in a much greater degree uh, than they are now. So if I, if I had to bet right now, I would bet that Hillary would be the nominee. Right. But if it was Obama, do you think some of that would be mitigated? Do you think, you know, there, there would be less uh, jump-started motivation, jump-started enthusiasm to – to beat uh, an Obama as there would be to beat a Hillary? Um, you know, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, the question is, do, uh, like, again, a lot of people didn't know John Kerry by the uh, first uh, 
you know, early in the election cycle last time. I mean, you had a bunch of, I mean, it was kind of in some sense resembles a little bit the Republican field now in terms of, you know, no one was really breaking 20 percent in the polls. I mean, it was very unsettled. And he kind of rallied in the end. Uh, but he was very aggressively defined in the general election. So uh, through talk radio, through blogs, through, through the media ultimately, and through paid advertising, um, so he was aggressively but, defined. But at the same it time, it wasn't, it wasn't like Obama people were turning time. out. It wasn't, peop- it wasn't like people turned out in 04 to stop John Kerry. Whereas, whereas what you're saying right. is what might save the GOP in 08 is, is Republicans turning out to stop Hillary. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I guess what I'm asking is, do you think something could be replicated that there would be a force of people turning out to stop Obama? Because I just, I just don't see there being as strong a right. built-in, you know, Obama's going to ruin us all as there is, oh, my God, here comes Hillary. But I think fundamentally, I mean, at some level, it's kind of secondary. Because, I mean, obviously, I mean, you don't want to be the guy who's kind of constantly against you know the other. I mean, you don't know, you don't want to be the guy who's just against the other guy. In in so we saw how well that worked out for Kerry right. in, in in 04. So I think there is a limit to kind of this Hillary. I mean, I think it will be useful for maybe you know for Republicans maybe to gin people up a little bit more. So maybe um, maybe a, a jump start for the car, which it might be a jump race. start, but I don't think it's going to cross the finish line. I mean, ultimately you need to have a nominee who you know is likable and people can trust and people actually like the guy and want to turn out for him so and and who and I forget who who do you think that is for the Republicans you know I think you know I've obviously been a Rudy guy <laughs> uh, so I like him you know I think I think it could potentially be any I mean I think it could potentially but frankly be all of them I don't think any of these guys are bad guys um, and I think uh, you know so I do think they have that appeal I mean some some, some of these guys don't have the name ID. Um, and maybe behind in the polls to because of that, uh, but generally, I mean, if you look at our candidates, are performing a lot better than our party brand is, is right now. Yeah, all of them are. Yeah, so I mean, even you know, even Romney, you know, he's made everyone makes the argument, you know, he can't he can't win. So the question is, Kerry again, you know, in, in 04, Rose, Rose. I mean, nobody thought he could beat Bush, and all of a sudden, wait, wow, he's ahead, he's ahead right after he wins Iowa. Uh, so the question is, one of these guys is going to have to count on that kind of boost that comes out of the primary uh, to really uh, to really help him take on Hillary in the general. Fair enough. And on that note, that these aren't all bad guys, we'll go ahead and uh, end it with you. Great. Thank you. Okay, Pat.